Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Tuesday, January 16th, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for January 16th, 2024. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log in to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in-person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And Senior Council Lindahl? Here. Thank you. Mayor Cavanaugh, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Adrian. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For proclamations, we have Ram Female Student Athletes Golden Jubilee Celebration. All right, and our very own Susan Farber is here to accept this proclamation this evening. One with another of our very own, I see. For those of us that are height challenged here. So, good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager, Van Milligan, City Staff, and Dubuque residents. Tonight, I am joined by fellow RAM student female athlete, Stephanie Valentine. And on behalf of our co-chair, Connie Bandy hodge and all of those who participated in women's sports at Dubuque Senior High over the past 50 plus years, we are honored to receive this proclamation acknowledging January 26, 27 as the inaugural Rams Female Student Athlete Golden Jubilee Celebration. I'm also honored to share a brief reflection on the legacy of Rams women's sports, which in its infancy in the 50s and 60s sponsored just three sports teams. Today, it has grown to over 12 with more than 300 female student athletes participating this year alone. Beginning in 1969, Senior inaugurated its annual award recognition for outstanding female and male student athletes. Over the past 55 years, students have been honored for their athletic achievements and school citizenship. As the first female recipient of this award, I am greatly appreciative. And beginning 1992, Senior inaugurated its annual Athletic Hall of Fame acknowledging former student athletes for their successes in all walks of life and for their contributions to their community and causes. Of special note, there have been 45 former female student athletes awarded this distinction, and two of us are here tonight to share in this distinction. On behalf of all of those who participated in women's sports at Senior over the past 50 plus years, we are mindful and proud of this experience and recognize the positive impact these team sports have had on our lives. We are beyond grateful for this occasion that honors and reunites senior high's female student athletes. Thank you for this proclamation. We urge everyone to come join us this weekend, the weekend, I'm sorry, of January 26, 27, especially Friday, 
when the senior Rams play the Waller Eagles at Nora Gymnasium beginning 6 o'clock. The Golden Jubilee will feature a tribute to past and present female student athletes during the women's basketball game. And a special note, this is also the annual Pink Out game where we will raise awareness for early breast cancer detection for those in our community who are battling cancer. Again, thank you very much for this proclamation. Well, and thank you both for being here to accept this proclamation. What a, what a great addition to other great events that happened throughout Dubuque. Uh, I was really excited to see this one come along and really glad that you and everyone who's worked on it have been able to put this together. It sounds like it's And so be Stephanie and I are also here to pr very proud to wear letter sweaters that still fit and of course my <laughs> tennis cover that we wore in 1967. So I just want you to know that we are just very proud, and I think we should get extra credit. That is, I definitely give it. That's pretty impressive. I know I have a whole bunch of stuff from high school. Definitely doesn't fit anymore. So thank you very much. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the illustrious history of women's sports at Dubuque Senior High School has achieved a momentous milestone commemorating over 50 years of excellence, and whereas an inaugural event to celebrate this remarkable golden jubilee will be held the weekend of January 26th and 27th, with a kickoff taking place in senior, Seniors Nora Gymnasium during the Senior Wallert Women's Basketball Game. And whereas the legacy of women's sports programs at Dubuque Senior High has thrived, captivating hundreds of talented female students, student athletes annually. From the inaugural days of cheerleading, women's golf, and women's tennis in the late 1950s and 1960s, to the expansive array of programs such as women's swim and dive, softball, volleyball, basketball, track and field, and cross country in the 1970s, followed by the additions of women's soccer in the late 1980s, women's bowling in the early 2000s, to the recently established women's wrestling. And whereas the participation of over 300 female student athletes in Dubuque Senior High School sports this year alone, alongside those who have woven this rich tapestry of women's sports since 1958, underscores the profound impact of these programs. And whereas high school sports, a platform for both girls and boys, have consistently proven to contribute to enhanced life skills, including emotional well-being, higher self-esteem, improved self-image, heightened self-confidence, strength of character, teamwork, and more. And whereas this momentous occasion aspires to reunite female student athlete alumni, extending a warm invitation to all past Rams to partake in the festivities with a special tribute at the basketball game on Friday, January 26th, and with social events scheduled throughout the celebratory weekend. Now therefore I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the 26th through 27th of January, 2024, as Ram Female Student Athletes Golden Jubilee Celebration. All right, Adrian. We will move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through four of the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Do we have anyone who would like to remove any of the consent items for separate discussion this evening? I see no one here. Do we have anyone virtually? Or? No virtual input or other input received. All right, thank you. All right, back to the table then. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second by Farber. Motion by Resnick and a second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Bell. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprang. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. 
We will move on to items set for public hearing. We have two. First is amended and restated urban renewal plan for Dubuque Industrial Center Urban Renewal Area version 2024.1 for February 19th, 2024. Second is resolution of necessity for the amendment of the Dubuque Industrial Center Economic Development District Urban Renewal Plan version 2024.2 for February 19th, 2024. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearings for the dates specified. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to boards and commissions. We have appointments for the Building Code Advisory and Appeals Board, the Equity and Human Rights Commission, and the Housing Appeals and Mediation Board. And I will just start by announcing that we have um, two applicants for two separate boards that are ineligible and are pulled from consideration. Philip Heim from the Building Code Advisory and Appeal Board and Wendy Hopp from the Housing Appeals and Mediation Board. All right, thank you, Adrian. Well, let's start with the Building Code Advisory and Appeals Board. So we have four three-year terms through January 1st, 2027. Um, boy, I, I forgot to ask about this question beforehand. Adrian, so these are specific to their specific roles within the board. Um, is it, would it be more appropriate to vote for each specific term in that case? I think so, Okay. just to make it cleaner. Okay, so then I, I basically we're gonna need to do this in three separate votes then. Um, so is everybody clear on that? So I'm gonna need to take a motion and a second for each one. So I would ask as you make the motion to please pay attention to who is qualified um, for which position on the board. Mr. Mayor. Um, so Ms. Roussel. I move to nominate Thomas Townsend for the electrical construction professional. Second. Okay. I got a motion by Roussel and a second by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. So I take another motion for another position, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that Adam Brown be appointed as the alternate electrical construction professional. Second by Sprank. Motion by Jones and a second by Sprank for Adam Brown to be appointed for the um, electrical construction professional. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. One more final motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that Corey Velasky be appointed to the HVAC construction professional uh, position on the board. Second by Wethel. <clears throat> Got a motion by Jones and a second by Wethel to appoint Corey Velasky to the HVAC construction professional position. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you all for that. Next up is the Equity and Human Rights Commission. Um, here we have one three-year term through January 1st, 2027, and we have three applicants. Um, I'll note there is a gender balance issue on this commission. Uh, so I would entertain a motion here, please. Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. That, that I, we need to do a roll call on this. My apologies. So we have three applicants there. So as we, uh, I will ask Adrian to please poll the council members and just name who you'd like to appoint. Roussel. Teresa Sampson Brown. Jones. Teresa Sampson Brown. Sprank. Teresa Sampson Brown. Resnick. Teresa Sampson Brown. Farber. Teresa Sampson Brown. Wethel. Teresa Sampson Brown. Kavanaugh. Teresa Sampson Brown. So Teresa Sampson Brown is appointed to the three-year term on the Equity and Human Rights Commission. Finally, we have the Housing Appeals and Mediation Board. Now here we have three three-year terms through January 1st, 2027, and we have three applicants. So I would entertain a motion on this one, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that Mary Gotts, Lou Hoffman, and Lynn Sutton be appointed to the three terms. Second. Got a motion by Jones, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. So Mary Gotts, Luke Hoffman, and Lynn Sutton are appointed to the three open terms on the Housing Appeals and Mediation Board. We will move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items Please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to and state your name and address. 
For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is Unified Development Code Amendment regarding Mini Warehouse. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed to be suspended. Second. Motion by Jones and a second by Resnick. And Sheena, turn it over to you, please. Hello, good evening. A little shorter than Wally, but just a little taller than Susan. <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to pull this up here. sure if you're seeing that on your screens there or not, but um, I just have a very, oh, there we go. Yep. Thank you. Just a very short presentation. So good evening, Mayor Kavanaugh, members of the City Council. The request before you this evening is a text amendment. The uh, applicant is requesting an amendment to allow mini warehouse use below the first floor as a permitted use in the C4 downtown commercial in the C5 central uh, business zoning districts. Uh, so currently, the Unified Development Code does allow um, mini warehouse use. It's permitted uh, as a permitted use in five of our zoning districts, two of our commercial districts, uh, as well as our three industrial zoning districts. Uh, and historically, mini warehouse use has not been uh, pro has been prohibited in the downtown area. Uh, this is largely just as it was seen as competing with essential and valuable commercial retail, office, and residential uses and spaces. Uh, and so today we have this request submitted by Mr. Rowan, uh, Tom Rowan, who owns property on Main Street uh, and is interested in being able to allow a mailing and storage type service in the lower level of his, pro of his property. Um, as we all are aware, over the last few years, there's been an increase in remote work as well as work from home options for, um, for, for employees. And so with that, there's also been this emerging trend where there's this increased need for mailing and storing type services, uh, especially in downtown areas. And so um, this amendment would allow for a property owner such as Mr. Rowan to use perhaps what would be otherwise maybe an underutilized portion of a property, that lower level, um, to meet this growing need, uh, while also preserving our street level and our upper level spaces for retail, commercial, and uh, other residential type uses. Uh, again, this, this amendment would be specific to the C4 and the C5 uh, zoning districts. Um, so by a vote of five to zero, the Zoning Advisory Commission has recommended approval of the text amendment. A simple majority vote is necessary to uh, approve the text amendment this evening, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the, com the council may have. All Thank right. You. Thank you very much, Sheena. We are in a public hearing to consider a request from Tom Rowan to amend the Unified Development Code to add mini warehouse below the first floor only as a permitted use in the C4 downtown commercial and C5 business district uh, zoning districts and the zoning Commission, Zoning Advisory Commission, excuse me, is recommending approval. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item tonight? Seeing no one here, do we have anyone virtually? No input received. Okay, thank you very much. Back to the table then for discussion. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. So first off, I want to um, thank Tom very much for the uh, restoration and repurposing of that building. And as we had talked uh, previously uh, in our work session about the um, support for actually urban living down in the downtown corridors, uh, we had talked about the fact that there's always a need for more amenities for those that are living there now and that will be there in the future as we expand housing opportunities and other kinds of amenities for folks. So I just wanted to uh, thank you very much for fulfilling that need. Uh, and um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for those that will be living, working, walking and playing in that area. So thank you, Tom. Right, thank you, Ms. Barber. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I'd like to echo all of that. Uh, I've watched this guy for a decade or so do things that others haven't done and do them better and faster. So congratulations. I'm sure this is going to pass. And thanks for thinking of it. Thank you. Anyone else? And I'll just say, um, you know, when I when I saw this, it was not an idea I had ever seen before, and I I was I really appreciated it. I, I like the fact that we're using space in the downtown area in a way that makes sense based on what we've all been through um, in the last few years. So, um, and, and also still preserving the 
the street level in the way we need to to make sure that we have um, good space for commercial and residential um, spaces. So I'm, I appreciate this. Definitely look forward to voting for it and I appreciate the commission's work on it as well. All right, with that, we have a motion by Jones, second by Resnick to receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? Move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second? A motion by Jones and a second by Resnick. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number two is proceedings for public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $3,200,000 state revolving fund sewer revenue loan. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. <clears throat> I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. And a motion by Roussel and a second by Wethel. Uh, Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Chief Financial Officer Jennifer Larson is recommending City Council approval of the suggested proceedings for a public hearing on the issuance of not to exceed $3.2 million of state revolving fund sewer revenue loans. Proceeds will be used to fund the construction of Tamarack Sanitary Sewer Extension, Twin Ridge Sanitary Sewer Extension, and Granger Creek Lift Station improvements. The Tamarack Sanitary Sewer Extension Project will extend sanitary sewer service to the existing unsewered commercial development, Tamarack Business Park, and provide future sanitary sewer service opportunities for the Crossroads Industrial Park area along the adjacent developed and undeveloped areas to the west. The Twin Ridge Sanitary Sewer Extension and Lagoon Abandonment Project will extend the sanitary sewer gravity system and connect into the existing Twin Ridge Subdivision Gravity Sewer System along with abandoning the existing lagoon system. With the completion of this project, the city will no longer need to per permit operate and maintain the lagoon system and the parcel currently occupied by the lagoon system would then be available for redevelopment. The Granger Creek Lift Station Improvements Project will increase the firm pumping capacity of the existing Granger Creek Lift Station from 500,000 gallons a day to 2.9 million gallons per day, which will provide the needed capacity to serve existing and proposed developments within sewer shed number four. In November 2021, the city issued a $465,000 SRF planning and design loan for the Tamarack Sanitary Sewer Extension, Twin Ridge Sanitary Sewer Extension, and Granger Creek Lift Station improvements. The planning and design loan had a 0% interest rate and no initiation or servicing fees. The $465,000 will be rolled into the SRF construction loan and is included in the issuance of not to exceed $3.2 million. State revolving capital loan notes will carry a variable 2.43% interest rate for 20 years with an annual servicing fee of 0.25%. There is also a one-time half of 1% upfront loan origination fee. The proceedings have been prepared to show as a first step the receipt of any oral or written objections from any resident or property owner to the proposed action of the council to authorize the form of loan and disbursement agreement and issue the notes to the Iowa Finance Authority. A summary of objections received or made, if any, should be attached to the proceedings. After all objections have been received and considered, if the city council decides to enter into the agreement and issue the notes, a form of resolution follows. It should be introduced and adopted entitled Resolution Taking Additional Action on Proposal to Enter into a sewer revenue loan and disbursement agreement. In the event the city council decides to abandon the proposal, then the form of resolution included said proceedings should not be adopted. In this event, a motion merely be adopted to the effect that such proposal is abandoned. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider the issuance of not to exceed $3.2 million in state revolving loan fund sewer revenue loan and proceeds will be used to fund the construction of the Tamarack Sanitary Sewer Extension, Twin Ridge Sanitary Sewer Extension, and Granger Creek Lift Station improvements. Do we have anyone here in chambers to address us on this item? Seeing no one here, do we have anyone virtually? No virtual input. Okay, thank you. Back to the table then. 
Mr. Mayor. Yes, Ms. Farber. I think it's important for those of us here and those of us listening to note that in total, the um, the fee and the interest rate would be less than 2.75%, which is just very uncommon these days. And um, as the state is being very gracious and um, with our rating as well. So I think it's just really a nice opportunity for us to uh, continue on uh, taking the benefit um, of these loans at a very reasonable uh, rate uh, of expense to the city. So I just want to bring that to everybody's attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Farber. All right. Any others? Okay. Well, motion here is to receive and file and adopt this resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Next is public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address when the Mayor asks if there is any in-person input. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the Mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then City staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes, and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Do we have any public input this evening? Seeing none here. Anything virtually? No one virtually. Okay. All right. With that, then, we can move on to action items. Action item number one is City Assessor Assessed Intactual Valuations Presentation. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. <clears throat> I move to receive and file and view the presentation. Second by Sprank. A motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. So, Troy, I think we can turn it right over to you. Good evening, everyone. Troy Passner, Dubuque City Assessor. Let's get up the presentation. It's, looks like it's coming on. Okay. Good evening. So I was just asked here to uh, kind of go over the whole 2023 assessment process and how that affects the um, uh, the taxable values also with that with some historic changes that we've had in our valuations in the last year and then um, kind of just go over the whole process of from start to finish from assessments to the taxable value so start right off I'm sorry I don't, I don't know if you noticed but your your comments and everything are shown oh, on the screen as a there we go oh, thank you Mike nice thank you I don't know if that's up there too we'll get rid of that So we're gonna start off with just uh, kind of go over just a little refresher on the tax cycle timing. So the January 1st, 2023 valuations were from what happened during the calendar year in 2022. And that also included the uh, biannual revaluation that we're required to do um, every other year. July 1 of 2023 through June 30th of 24 is the ownership and accrual period, which is used anytime a property is transferred. That's what they'll use for calculating taxes and prorating them. And when the um, property is sold, right around by November 1st of 2023 is when the assessment limitations or what they also call the rollback, both of those terms are synonymous. That sets the, um, for each class of uh, um, properties, the uh, Department of Revenue sets that. And now the auditors can start doing their calculations to know what the taxable values will be. So then in this time frame between December and April is the budgetary hearings start to determine all the revenue needs, um, which will end up determining the levy rates. And then the April 30th is the new budget deadline from the Senate file 718 that was passed last year. July and August of 2024 is when the tax bills be uh, calculated and mailed out to all the owners. And then the first and second half of the taxes are due in September and March. September 24 and March of 25. So really, what causes uh, taxes to change on a property? 
there's uh, really four main, main ingredients to this which could um, create uh, a change in one's taxes. First is just the overall uh, governmental spending between the different uh, authorities that uh, uh, use property taxes to fund their needs. Also, it could be changes to credits and exemptions. Uh, obviously, assessed value changes also um, would include this. It could be anything from new construction, revaluations, or maybe if a credit or an exemption has now become eligible or ineligible. And then there's also could be shifts, uh, tax burden shifts between classes. This happens sometimes if the legislature would change something or just um, some legislature that's already in place with uh, assessment limitation uh, numbers that can uh, fluctuate from one cycle to the next. <clears throat> so what really then causes assessment changes? That's what uh, we work on in our office. And I'm just gonna kind of go over the difference between revaluation and new construction. So revaluations tend to be related to the equalization process that I was just uh, alluding to a minute ago. It's on that odd numbered year. So every other year we're required to look at each class of property, um, primarily I guess it'd be residential, uh, which also is included now with uh, multi-res or we have to call it res three plus, which would be apartment, uh, apartments that are three or more units, uh, commercial and agricultural are the ones that are equalized. <clears throat> Another thing is doing a, a reappraisal review uh, that can change valuations. And then sometimes just doing <coughs> jurisdiction-wide changes based on statistics, reviews, um, and that sort. Obviously, new construction, any changes added uh, are taken away from uh, on a property. And that's uh, the physical changes, which we would call really just the hammer and nails uh, on it. And then new in uh, 2023, legislation uh, mandates that the auditor is now supposed to file a report with the Department of Revenue indicating if an assessed value change was made due to revaluation or to new construction, and I believe they want to look at that for the next few years. So residential properties. So 2023 was a very uh, unique revaluation year uh, with the amount of increases that had to be made throughout the whole state. Um, for most of the states, average assessed increases were 20 to 30 percent, and uh, this was from the 21. Since we're doing it every two years, so this is taking into account really with the what the market happened in the calendar year of 2021 and 2022. <clears throat> so overall, the uh, revaluation changes that were needed to be made for uh, the city of Dubuque for the residential and multi-residential, or what we call Res 3 Plus. The average of those was 23.52. I believe the uh, average city residential uh, single family uh, home and duplexes uh, included in that was just a little under 23%, was like 22.9. And the apartments, uh, the rest three plus were at almost 31%. But adding the two of them up, they're, looked, they're put together in one group now. Uh, we still value them based on the market. Um, and our job is to you know, value to the market. So we take all of those sales that transpired in 2022 and uh, for each class of property, took all of the residential sales and our ratio was uh, 70 in the mid 70s. So we have between, our median ratio is supposed to be between 95 and 105. So obviously we were out of compliance. So that needed uh, to be made some adjustments from that. So that's where we came up with the 23% uh, uh, is what we needed to increase overall based on all of the uh, we analyze them by each neighborhood. We have 50 neighborhoods that we look at, but in, in total, we needed to come up with 23%, and uh, that's what we got to, to come within compliance. So now that we had that, the valuation set and got them as close as we could to the market value, there is what's called that assessment limitation or the rollback. What that is is... Um, the state only allows a 3% allowable growth for residential, which is also residential and the Res 3 Plus. And with agricultural, they only allow a 3% growth statewide. So they take what that statewide average increase was and they'll roll that back. So it only has a 3% uh, um, more taxable value uh, overall statewide. So in 2023, residential parcels will receive a 46 point, I'm just rounding it here, 46.34% rollback. 
which means uh, if you had a $100,000 property, the taxable value would be $46,342. So the 2022 rollback was 54.65%, significantly a lot more um, of, a, of a factor there. The 2022 factor was um, originally at 56.49, and it was changed last year, if you remember about this time, to that 54.65, and that was when they combined the multi-res in with residential, so that shouldn't happen again. That's not an ongoing issue. That was just a one-time. <clears throat> so here I'm just gonna give an example of a, like a res three plus uh, residential um, or ag dwelling properties that increased um, right around this increase that I have. So if you had a assessed value for 2022 of $176,000, uh, we had to make our increase to 23.86%. So then that uh, 23 value now would be $218,000. So using the rollback, which is what we're currently at that 54.65% that we're currently paying the taxes on right now, that taxable value for that $176,000 property is $96,184. Using this new rollback factor of 46.34% on that $218,000 new assessed value, the taxable value is $101,027, which is an increase of 5.04%. So even though we increase almost 24%, uh, the taxable value is really 5% more. So which tells you if the state allows a 3% growth, we were a couple of percent higher than what the state average was. So going on to commercial and industrial properties. Commercial properties saw about a 20 to 30% increase in value um, along with most of Iowa. Um, ind industrial properties also uh, saw an increase but they didn't uh, see the, quite the increase as the commercials did. They are not part of the equalization process. Part of also the 2023 valuations is we use the new manual that the state has that we put that on for the 23 year. <clears throat> so when doing that we just um, you know, change any of the values they need to be changed using the new state uh, cost manual. So per S Senate file 619, the state reimbursed backfill, uh, the amount is reduced one eighth each year. So that's going back to the original backfill on commercial industrial properties. Uh, you paid 100% uh, if you were valued at uh, say 100,000 on a commercial industrial property, your taxable value was $100,000. And so when they graduated and rolled that back, uh, I think back in about 2011, 12, if I remember, they did it from 100 to 95 and then to 90. So this is the backfill amount that's been in existence since then. Um, but now they are uh, decreasing at one eighth per year. Another change was uh, there's now the two tiered assessment limitation. It replaces the business property tax credit. Prior to this, um, for commercial industrial properties, you needed to sign up for the business property tax credit. And then uh, anytime you had a change in ownership, legal description, any change like that, you'd cost for a re-sign. The state got away with re-signing it. They're still funding the credit. Uh, now it's a difference. Uh, the way they're doing it is they're just taking the first 150,000 of assessed value on commercial, industrial, and railroad properties and treating and giving it the same rollback as whatever that current year residential rollback is. And then anything over the $150,000 is still at that locked in 90% rollback. <clears throat> so for an example of uh, that two tiered limitations on how that taxable valuation calculation would be uh, um, used is if you're taking a property with a $300,000 assessed value, that first 150,000 would receive that 46% rollback. So that's taxable value would be 69,510. And then anything over that 150,000 is at that 90% factor. So in this sample, uh, you'd have another 150,000 uh, at 90%, so you'd end up with 135,000. So the taxable value on a $300,000 um, property uh, would be 204,510. So for 23, the assessed value added uh, due to new construction, just showing the last five years, we added 51, 51 million, a little over 51 million in total new construction. <coughs> Just showing throughout the last five years there. Then going through the 2023 total assessed value changes. So agricultural saw a 28% increase. 
which was equated to a million dollars, so we don't have a lot of agricultural valued property in the city. Then the residential registry plus, which also includes any ag dwellings on those ag agricultural properties. The uh, average uh, assessed value increase was 24.26%. Commercial was 26.25, and the industrials were 5.58%, which gave a total assessed value uh, change of 1,174,000 or 74,400,928. And then here's just a five-year review of the taxable value changes, the um, going from 2019 through 2023, uh, 21, just to kind of note between 21 and 2022, if you remember doing uh, budgets the last year there, there really wasn't much change in that uh, valuation. <clears throat> and then for 23, we have an uh, increase there of uh, the 2.843 billion from the 2.689. So looking ahead, 2024 is that even number assessment year, not a revaluation year, so we're not revaluing them out to the market. Um, so far, the market stayed, has stayed strong when we got our assessments up to in that 99% threshold when we were finished with that. After looking at all the 23 sales, we're right around 95% right now. So um, actually, so the markets has actually continued to go up a little bit from when we set those values about a year ago. <clears throat> So then, uh, but so but most properties, unless you had a change specific to your property, you won't see too many changes for as far as the residential goes. Uh, we are working on an ongoing reappraisal project, um, which that could that could that could be affected to a few people. The next major changes will be for the 25 assessment, 2025. And then kind of to date, fewer homes are really being sold. We're down uh, about 15 percent, it looks like, for the total. Uh, amount of sales that have come in for the last year for the number of sales, even, but the sales <coughs> prices have still remained high. <clears throat> and then like I just mentioned before, uh, we're also continuing with a um, area by area reappraisal project. So we're taking each of those map areas and we've been for the last, uh, I think a little over two years now, uh, going through each one, kind of just actually doing a window review. We're pulling them up with our staff, something we've taken on uh, in the office ourselves and going through and looking at it, seeing if our listing looks correct. If it isn't, then we're notifying the owner uh, to take a look at the property. So new legislation that happened for 2023, the House File 718. It, uh, just some bullet points on that, kind of creates some levying limits on cities and counties based on the amount of taxable value growth. Requires new mailings by the county auditors to property owners by March 20th regarding how proposed levies would affect taxes. It also created a new homestead uh, 65 plus homestead exemption. So in the month of uh, about the middle of May and all of June was uh, exceptionally busy uh, for our office. Uh, we had a lot of people, I believe, um, four, four to 5,000 is what ended up uh, signing up by July 1 was the deadline. It was passed by the legislature there in, I think, right around sometime early May. So with that, uh, what it does is it creates um, this homestead exemption. It's an addition to the homestead credit. So if you're 65 and older, you qualified for the homestead credit, uh, you signed up for it, you would get the uh, homestead exemption. The first year, it's phased in over two years. The first year, it would take another $3,250 of uh, taxable value off your property. And then uh, for the 20... Uh, for assessment, it will take $6,500 off of that taxable value on the property, which really equates to, I'm just roughly been telling people about $100 that first year and about $200 savings uh, for the second year and thereafter. And like the homestead credit, it's just a one-time sign up. So as long as you still maintain, own the home and occupy it as your full-time residence, you'll also continue to get this 65 plus exemption. There was also an increase to the military exemption. This did not require any new signups at all. It's just if you already had the military exemption, it's going to go from uh, the $1,852 that it was at for a long time to $4,000. And then also, like I mentioned earlier, the uh, auditor is also supposed to report the uh, with this new <coughs> legislation, uh, the assessed values and, and new construction and revaluation. And with that, I'll lead us to any questions. All right. 
Well, thank you, Troy. Really appreciate you being here to explain yeah. this. Um, Thanks for inviting me. I, you know, I think uh, this is a complicated issue in a lot of people's minds, and and I think you get a bit of a bad rap uh, as this in, in this whole discussion because I think a lot of people conflate the idea of the free market and what it does to housing um, housing prices to what you're doing in the assessor's office. And I just want to give you the chance to say this clearly. You aren't dictating the sale prices of houses and properties as we go through the year. That's the free market that does that. Is that accurate to say? Cor correct. Yeah. Right. So, but you are calculating the assessed value of properties based on what the market has done in that year. And it's really, it's a two-year cycle that you're working on. <clears throat> Correct. Correct. Yep. Yes. Yep. So, so that assessed value, because I think, you know, in the discussion of this house file last year, for example, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, assessments are going up, assessments are going up. And one of the things that's left out of that discussion is our home prices have gone up. Our values have gone up. The value of the property that we own, whether that's residential, commercial, industrial, that, that, that property values have risen. Mm -hmm. But then there's one step further, I think, that people miss in this discussion as well, and that's the rollback factor, which is a really significant piece of this whole puzzle, isn't it? The, the fact that whatever your assessed value is on your home is not what you pay on your tax bill. Is that, that's correct, right? That is correct. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's the rollback factor, as you're discussing, which is set every single year by the Department of Revenue. So we have a rollback factor. So this year, if it was 46 point something percent. Yep. Yep. That's what we're actually paying in our, on our tax bill is 46% of what, and with other exemptions that are involved. Yes. Yep. Yeah. That's 46% will be what we will be paying this next year. That's what we're right. using right now in that. Correct. Yep. Yeah. And then next year after this, then the Department of Revenue will set another rollback factor and that, that will happen as well. Okay. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to get Correct. a chance to really clarify that because I think that was one of the major confusions as we had this whole discussion. And mm -hmm. um, as I know, even as the legislature was setting some of this, I was getting a sense that even some legislators were struggling with the idea that the rollback was going to be a factor in being able to correct some of the the, the pain we feel when we go to pay that that tax bill on our property because mm -hmm. the that rollback factor wasn't really as discussed as much as it probably could have been. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, exactly. And that, that, I think that's part of the whole presentation was just to um, explain that. Right. Even though they went up 23%, there's really 5% on average. It's an increase of 5% in your taxable value. Right. So that, right. that's what we try to tell everyone when they sell, you know, all the notices went out and it's right. like your taxes are not going to go up whatever it went up in your, in your area, you know, the 20 some percent, it's, they're not, you're not going to see that uh, yeah. apples for apples that way. That, and using this and that calculation and looking at it, I mean, what the rollback uh, was established, you know, by the state, I mean, it, it works in this situation. It just, you know, took that huge increase and, and, yeah. made it manageable you know yeah. there's been other discussion um you know we invite uh, we have an east central district to uh, invite all the legislators in and about 17 jurisdictions in east central iowa and had a panel with the legislators and, and you know we were kind of mentioning if you know s some increased a lot more than that and we were obviously a couple percent higher if we had a five percent increase than they allow a three percent so i mean the thing i've i've always kind of questioned is wondering if all of the numbers go to the state and we're required to be assess based off of that market. We're reacting to what those market sales were. And if you have all of our valuations, then um, why can't you just roll it back 3% for each jurisdiction? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just my personal thing. I'm not, you know, sure. legislating for that, I guess, to say. But that, to me, would kind of make sense, too, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. but... Uh, but at least with this is, uh, and, and I see that in some areas, maybe saw uh, were, were a lot less. So if, let's say if they were only at 18% and the statewide average was 21 some percent, they actually saw a taxable decrease in value, even though their market went up 18%. So, right. yeah. yeah, and I think um, just to, real quick, and then I'll open it up for questions and any discussion here, but um, the, other, the other piece of this, and this is what we're gonna be talking about over the next couple of months that's, that's really important, is that if we further cap that ability for any jurisdiction, any city or any county to further <laughs> levy taxes on assessed values of homes. If we, if we add even more than just than the rollback, which, which is what happened last year, we're gonna start to see that in the services and the additions that we can make as a city government. And we're already, so we're, we're not on the same schedule as a city as every other city in Iowa, but as you pay attention to other cities in Iowa right now, the discussion is immediately starting that 
the budgets that are that we're going to be able to pass across the state are much more limited this year than they've been in years past because of some of the new exemptions that we have and the caps that are set on governments. This is not so much in your office, but it's a part of this discussion that I think is a really important piece of this and um, is going to be a central theme to the discussion that we have about our budget here in the city of Dubuque. Uh, it's gonna complicate things for us uh, and it's gonna, we'll, more to come on that, but I, I think I just wanna be able to have, you know, we'll kick that discussion off here and um, be able to talk about it. But thank you very much for explaining this for all of us. Ms. Farber. Yeah, um, talking about billions and being billionaires here, um, the 2023 assessed value changes is uh, 1.174, so a billion plus. And then could you tell us the difference between the excess value changes and the valuable, the taxable value changes on the next page where it starts at 2.5 billion and this year was 2.843 billion. I just didn't quite understand how we got to all of those billions for the taxable value um, with my challenged mathematics here. So if you could just help us better understand where these uh, big numbers come from. Sure. Thank so you. The, um so on page 11 there, that the yep. 2023 assessed value changes, if you, those were all of the changes that were made due to either revaluation or new construction. So that was, we added an assessed value, the 1, $1 billion, $174 million, mm -hmm. If you looked at the next page that shows how many, how much taxable value there, that's after all of those rollbacks were applied to each class of property. So that's after, um, the assessed value of residential, multi-residential gets that 46% rollback. Commercial industrials get, 10, get only a 10% rollback, they're 90%. So that's adding all of that up. That's where we come up with the 2.843 billion. Technically, um, I don't know, I don't have that in a slide here, but we have um, between five and six billion dollars of assessed value in the city is our assessed value and taxable value is the 2.843 billion, which is, um, I wrote that down. The 2.843 billion is 5.7% more taxable value than the 2022 um, of value of 2.68 billion. And from that figure, you take away the rollback, is that correct? That, that's, that's, and that's, that's how we get to where that's, we are. That's okay. where we get to where we're at, Thank right? You. So, so that 100, and, so technically there's 154, I'm just rounding here, but 154 million more dollars of taxable value from 2022 to 2023. Okay. You know, even though there was that one billion, I guess I can go back up to there. Even though there's one billion 174 million more okay. of assessed value there. So it's an yeah. equation. Okay, it's thank you equation. very it's, much it's for that. Exactly discussion. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank mm -hmm. you. No, multiple equations, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, the, the community, well, Iowa freaked out when the assessed valuations went up. And that's something that you really ought to be proud of. That means that things that we're doing are working to make your property more valuable and that uh, the things that you own have increased in value. Um, what, what's usually missing in that conversation, it was certainly missing in the legislative conversation because, as the mayor pointed out, a number of lawmakers had no concept of how the rollback works. Um, but that number is affected then by what I always like to explain as other numbers. You can't just talk about that number without talking about the other numbers because the other numbers dramatically reduce the impact, the tax impact of the increased value of your property. Um, you get to enjoy the increased value of your property. If you go to sell your property, you get to enjoy that increased amount of money. Um, and all that happened um, because you've taken care of the property, because the valuations went up, because sales happened. And I like to think that a part of all that happened because of good programming in, in your city governments, in your local governments that have, that have increased the value to the community by keeping infrastructure up, by keeping public services up, and keeping interest in living in the community and buying those properties and living in them and working in them um, viable to, to keep those numbers up. So it's not the end of the world when your assessed value goes up. It's a good thing. Um, because other numbers come into play to keep it from hurting you. And that's, that's kind of what the law, lawmakers were trying to do. Now they've created this complex um, mess of a system that takes, uh, takes the city assessor to come to the city council chamber to explain it to us every couple of years. And we much appreciate that. Um, and I gotta tell you, Troy, how much I appreciate you because you really understand all of this and you do a great job with it. And you've explained it to, to people dumber than us 
um, and smarter than us, very, very well, and very, very gently, and very, very thoroughly on occasion after occasion. And one of the things that that I like to point out to the community is we get calls about everything from potholes to loose dogs to to noise at night to speeding vehicles. I've never ever had a call complaining about the city assessor's office. It's because we got good people there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jones? Anyone else? Mr. Resnick? Yes. Thank you for all the facts. Nothing but the facts. So I would like you to do a couple things. First of all, um, you know, property values are up and the value of money is down. That's always a bad combination. And, you know, for our taxpayers, especially when they say, well, my taxes are up $100, you know, more than last year. What's going on? Well, I mean, that's why. I mean, our, our taxes, our, our valuations are up and our value of the money is down. So it just takes more money to equal, you know, in value what was going on. Um, what I would like you, if you could do, using common language and few, very few numbers, <laughs> could you please tell our citizens the practical effect of all the different changes in these last two years, uh, what what are the, what is the effect on... Uh, let's just say, a typical citizen of Dubuque, um, what is the struggle that the, that the city is going to be going through, or is it going to be easier for us uh, to, uh, to accomplish our goals of, of getting a good value for our citizens? So, good question. Um, it really comes down to there's, on the average residential property, there's 5% more there of taxable value. Um, like when everybody, you know, would come in and talk to us on their assessment, you know, you never hear them say, well, tax, my taxes keep going down. It's always, I get it. But everything just with like you were mentioning with all the services, you know, that you're all tasked to provide to the citizens here in Dubuque is typically those services don't go down in cost. It's like we're, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a gallon of milk or to fix a pothole or whatnot. Right. So just like you were saying that the value of what you're getting is less especially when we've had years of higher inflation. So um, what I can tell you is that it, it went up the 23% in valuation, but the taxes won't be up that 23%. So if we went up 5% in taxable valuation on an average house, then it really comes down to on your tax bill, that's made up primarily, I mean, our office is included in that, but is primarily the city, the school, and the county. So what are those entities needing to budget to fund the services that they've been, you know, uh, elected to, uh, to, to govern over. So, <clears throat> you know, that's kind of, that is the question, you know, is, is what will that be? There's so many pieces of this though, that the state uh, also is, and that's kind of getting above, way above my pay grade on this as far as what they're funding and not funding, but it just seems like they're funding less things uh, you know, and then w at what point does that uh, incur more onto those major taxing authorities like yourself? Um, the homestead credit the homes and the military exemption went up, which is great, but it's uh, not funded by the state. It's that's taken on. That's taken on. You know, um, that's a that's a taxable loss that has, has to be incurred, you know, by us. So that's. I don't know. I can't answer that question unless I knew what, what you know. Right. It's very you know, complicated. It's very and complicated, you know, and, and, and you could just say you could do your job and you keep it to, uh, let's just say it's a few percent increase over the prior year, but one of those other taxing bodies uh, has to go up 10 percent because of whatever reasons. Well, then you combine that and and uh, if each one had the same levy, let's say each one was ten dollars, you know, and the one had to go up three percent and the other one had to go up ten percent. Well, you know, it's not three percent, then it's it's you know in between that. So that's that's the whole factor in all that, and that's where a lot of times, you know, someone will come in to us and ask us, you know, and want to know why their taxes have gone up, and um, you know, maybe their valuation never really even changed, you know, and uh, but. Um, uh, that's that's yeah that's very good that's a good question that's it's hard to say I I think if if everybody's you know typically you know what do we see three four percent increase in a lot of times you know is what um, you know what taxes could you know could go up um, is that going to be what's going to happen again I mean I don't 
You know, there's there's res those restrictions by the state, and then also the things that are not funded now. I don't know. I don't know. Well, thank you. you yeah. uh, uh, so I, I just think some things are impossible, like when I ask you to make this a simple. Yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not simple. I, um, finally, just to, so that we know, um, the state allows 3%, but the Buke residential is up 5%. Mm -hmm. It's going to go up 5%. And they say, well, how can you do that? And so we were, it has to be between the 95. It has to get up to 95. And we were underneath. So we're, we're still trying to make up. Is that it? So uh, um, our... Our assessed value, our median sale price is supposed to be between 95 and 105, and uh, it wasn't. We were like in the 70s, 76, I think, or something like that was the ratio. So then we had to increase to get up to that, uh, in between that 95 and 105, we actually revalued, we got to 99% is what our median ratio was for residential. So that set that whole, so we had to go up to 23, almost 24% overall. <clears throat> The state only allows 3% growth statewide. So statewide, that increase must have been in that 21% range. So we were at 23%, so that's why we went up 5% into our taxable value. We were a little above what the state average was. Great. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mike. Um, if, if I could point one thing out is, in the end, the determination of how much property taxes uh, individual pays is based on the property tax rate that's adopted by the different legislative bodies, the city council, the county board, the community college board. And in the case of the city of Dubuque, um, with the current year, so I'm not talking about the year that we're going to be doing the budget in uh, six to eight weeks. Uh, in the current year, uh, there's only 11 cities in the state of Iowa that have a population greater than 50,000. Dubuque is one of those. Uh, you adopted the lowest property tax rate of those 11 cities. Um, the average of those other 10 cities is 49% higher than Dubuque's property tax rate. And the highest ranked city, Waterloo, their property tax rate is 110% higher than Dubuque's property tax rate. So the council has been very judicious on how they uh, uh, levy the property tax rate. Now the state of Iowa for next fiscal year, the budget you're about to consider has put a, a, a revenue cap on. And so that's gonna restrict uh, the choice that the mayor and city council has to make about what kind of resources the city has to deliver purpose, uh, uh, the um, services that need to be delivered. But in fact, um, the, our city council and you, the city council, mayor and city council have been very judicious when you adopt the property tax rate. Thank you, Mike, for pointing that out. Well, there's gonna be much more to come on this discussion. Like I said, this is uh, one, one piece of the puzzle here. So thank you very much, Troy, for all the work that you do and thanks for being here. Yeah, you're welcome, thank you. And I just wanna to say to anybody, I wanna reach out or have questions on any of this, yeah, feel free to reach out. Thank you for that Thank invitation. You. Appreciate it. All right. Well, um, like I said, much more to come, so we'll be having more discussions in the months ahead. For now, motion on the table here is to receive and file and hear that presentation. So, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number two is Water and Resource Recovery Center odor abatement efforts update. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file and hear the report. Second. Second. Got a motion by Jones, second by Farber. So we're going straight to Darren or Mike, do you have anything for us? All right, straight to Darren. It's nice to see some green trees, so thanks for showing that. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and City Council, Darren Meering, uh, Water and Resource Recovery Center and Director. Um, just gonna give an update um, on our odor reduction efforts. I'm mainly gonna be talking about 
um, things that we've done since or occurred or milestones we're working towards since our last meeting, but I will touch a little bit on just a little bit of background, just a reminder of, of some of the issues, um, and how we how we arrived at this point in time. Uh, so again, just a reminder, especially talking about the more recent, extra, what I call extraordinary orders um, uh, that resulted from a, have a routine inspection and a contractor uh, made an error in putting some equipment back together and that impacted our anaerobic digesters. Um, and then in order for us to kind of maintain compliance with the Federal Clean Water Act, basically our permit, we had to modify how we handled uh, waste uh, at our facility. And that um, required us to store wastewater in some tanks that are open, in, open to the atmosphere. And you kind of see those two large white areas in that photo. Those are the two excess flow tanks. So that's where we've been storing some of that excess uh, waste. So uh, since um, uh, the last meeting or what we've been working on, um, we've been exploring legal remedies related to this, this uh, um, maintenance contractor. Um, letter was uh, put in the mail today, notifying them of the issue and starting that discussion with them. Uh, also been looking at steps to take to prevent this from occurring again. Now, the digesters themselves, they that's really what the issue is that why we can't handle the waste the way we normally did once they get kind of upset then we kind of have to look at it and nurse them back to health and you know they can things can go wrong for many reasons for a digester but this particular issue um, we're you know the, the equipment failure that we had we're, we're adjusting we've adjusted the maintenance schedule and timing so that if something like this happened again it wouldn't have this effect um, stocking spare parts to make sure that if something happens with this equipment we can change it out in a day or two and not have any impact on the digester. And then also just in the event that something like this, because we've proven that it can happen, so, um, but we identified uh, the ability to um, uh, rent a backup equipment that could be then delivered on site and run if we absolutely had to do it. Uh, so that is another option we've identified and, and we can adjust the system to be able to accommodate those temporary measures. And again, the, the main thing we're trying to do is return these digesters back or, or nurse them back to health. Uh, so to do that, um, I guess, yeah, to do that, we've been introducing sludge from, from a healthier digesters, recirculating it back into the ones that are, that are ailing or not producing like they should. We've transported about 90,000 gallons of uh, anaerobic digester sludge from Iowa City and pumped it into the... Uh, Digesters, and that's really like when these were first built. That's how you create the biology in these systems. Is normally you just populate that from seed sludge from other facilities in the area, and so we've been trying to uh, jumpstart this and, and the biological activity by transporting and importing or pumping those into the the ailing digesters. Also adjusting the alkalinity. Part of the process, the anaerobic digester. Dige digestion process it produces acids and so you have to have the alkalinity in there to kind of mitigate those acids so that the whole the pH doesn't drop precipitously and, and affect the other types of bacteria that then turn the waste into ultimately into methane and uh, carbon dioxide so um, we've also been we've been entered in about I think 12,000 pounds of, of basically baking soda into the system to increase alkalinity um, and we've been monitoring the health of the system um, and two of, two of the digesters are now with, back within normal operating parameters, so that's a good thing. The other two are still sluggish, and we kind of really need three to be back online and ultimately four to be a really good position, which we're, we'll, we'll get to. Um, we are introducing some of the um, waste back into that other digester, but it's just really sluggish and not taking off like we would expect it, but we're still, still working on, on that. And, and looking at options there. Um, and then, as I pointed out, the, the next step, once we you know, get these digesters functioning and, and the, the waste, being able to handle the waste as normal, uh, which we still expect in the next few weeks, so we don't, we don't think it's months and months, but um, 
but then it's going to be introducing this, what do we do with the waste that's been st temporarily stored in these, these two or excess flow tanks? So we were able to reintroduce the waste that was stored in the north excess uh, flow tank. So that's been reintroduced into the system. There is still a little bit left in that tank just due to the weather and getting the, the last few inches out, and that'll be cleaned when weather permits. So then the next issue is, is the south excess tank um, and try to, re, you know, how do we get rid of that um, material? The, the, the default would be to enter, enter it back into the system. That would have to be done slowly to make sure that it doesn't upset the system. And so that, that could take, you know, that took, could actually take a couple of months. It all just depends on how the system reacts and how many, how many of the four digests are, are, you know, up to speed and functioning properly. But we have been looking at other options on how to handle that waste. And so we have taken quotes from contractors to remove and dispose of the waste. So essentially take it from our facility and dispose of it elsewhere. So we do have a, a quote and we do have um, funding set aside that we can utilize for that. And that is what we're going to look to pursue in doing this coming February once the digesters are up and operational and we no longer have to temporarily store waste there, then we would look to use this contractor and have that material then removed. So the nice thing about that is they can get that process done in a week to 10 days. They can have it out of there, gone and, and disposed of. And they're, they're permitted, so they're able to do that uh, uh, within the bounds of the law and, and uh, environmental regulations. So, I mean, no matter how we deal with the waste, there is gonna be a period even there where if it takes them a week, they're gonna have to stir it up and there is gonna be a period where those odors are gonna kind of be, well, you know, when you stir something up, it's gonna dispose of more, but it'll be a short-term pain, but then it'll um, be done, you know, done with and, and uh, dealt with. So we're hoping to do that in February yet, depending on how these digesters come, but that's our expectation that we'd be able to clean those in tanks in February and have this issue kind of behind us. And again, depends on the weather. If we have weather like we did this week, it could be longer, but it's um, supposed to warm up, I think, again. And, and they can do it in cold conditions, just not, you know, 10 below. <laughs> Moving on to the more of the, uh, just the odor reduction analysis, the more long-term study to address odors at the facility. So I had pointed out this out the last time, just we'd identified the one location of dosing the system with some hydrogen peroxide. So this is kind of a repeat from last, last time I gave an update. But again, this will be part of an improvement package recommendation with the FY25 budget to make this a permanent um, <clears throat> addition to our treatment process. Um, the other thing we, I talked about doing additional dosing, additional locations where we can address hydrogen sulfide in the system. So uh, we have, um, we'll be taking delivery this week uh, of another uh, chemical dosing skid. So it's kind of really a temporary setup that can um, monitor dosing rates, um, make sure that it's going in, and, and then also takes measurements at the same time so that they can uh, analyze how, how that is affecting the system. What is the effect on hydrogen sulfide? Uh, take those readings in real time and, and basically get the answers we need as far as um, how much of, of additional chemicals we want to add to the system. So we're taking delivery later this week of both a skid and a storage tank. The, I talked about dosing between the uh, um, digesters and the, and the centrifuge, and that's one of the places we're going to be dosing. This time, instead of hydrogen peroxide, we're going to be dosing with uh, ferric chloride. And the, the, the benefit of that is not only will that also help to uh, break down hydrogen sulfide and bind up the sulfur, but it'll also help with the struvite condition that we have. So it'll take care of uh, some of those mineral deposits, prevents that from occurring and kind of gumming up our system. So that'll be a, a real benefit. Uh, there's a huge maintenance cost for that and the system just doesn't work as efficiently as it, as it could or should uh, because of that struvite. I mean, we say the word struvite, but it's really like a, like, a, like a gallstone. It's almost the same thing. It's a mineral deposit that has to be passed through the system and neither plumbing system, either human body or our system likes that. So. This will really help with that. So that's supposed to be, uh, they have this equipment delivered later this week. It's 
It's going to take them a little bit to get set up. We're starting to take some preliminary readings, get some baseline data um, later this week and in the, the following weeks, uh, have that system set up in, in the first part of February. And then later on in February, we're going to do a, um, there'll be a mass, uh, nutrient mass balance analysis to better quantify. We, we've looked at hydrogen sulfide to some extent, but we also want to look at where are the other nutrients in the system because we might want to dose with additional places with hydrogen or ferric chloride again to address struvite, but also odor, odor reduction throughout. Um, and then we'll continue to look at this study and see that other tank that we're taking is actually going to be for the next place we're going to dose. So they have a tank that they weren't going to be using. So while they're bringing this skid, they're going to bring this tank and it's going to be set up in this, this study that we uh, is performed in mid-February that will lead to where we decide we're going to dose the system at an additional location, at additional location. So we've got one identified. Um, it's after the, uh, um, the aeration tank overflow, after the uh, anaerobic, or I'm sorry, the actually aerobic uh, digestion or treatment system. And then we'll continually, once we have these systems set up, we'll continually monitor them, make sure that we're getting the reduction in the hydrogen sulfide that we anticipated. And so we'll always kind of monitor that and adjust chemicals accordingly, which, which we do with other chemicals there. We use a polymer, it's the same thing. Uh, continually assess that, uh, the overall effectiveness of the reduction. And, and I, as I pointed out last time too, you know, it's not, it's not like if we just introduce more chemicals, you automatically get more odor reduction. There is a point where you won't get any more reduction. And in fact, you could start to harm the actual process. You could, in essence, poison the, the system if you continue to add uh, these other chemicals. So that's, that's part of the study as well. Um, and then we'll, I'll have this update on the, City's website as well for, for people um, tomorrow and, and try to keep people updated in that, that manner. And that was the end of the presentation. Gotcha. Thank you, Darren, very much. Uh, you know, I, I have to just say, I really appreciate the detail with which you're coming with these presentations for us and for the entire community so we know what's going on. I also appreciate the detailed steps you're taking. I mean, it's clear to me that you're doing what you need to do to be able to work through this process. As frustrating as the process has been for everybody, you're working through it, and we appreciate that. And then the last piece, adding that website, I think has been key to be able to make sure that people can stay updated is really, really important. Questions or discussion? Ms. Farber. Right, yeah, so I did have conversation with some folks that actually live on that corridor, mm -hmm. and I uh, just want to read to you just one little sentence here. Uh, prior to Christmas, the problems were still very evident and on occasion totally offensive. Um, so, and I know that, you know, since then it's been freezing, and I'm not sure people are outdoors as much, so I'm not quite sure if the odor in their minds is still, has been abated enough. Um, I was just wondering, and I, I agree with what the mayor said, that it's, you, you're doing an outstanding job and the information provided is, is incredible and detailed uh, and very focused uh, and uh, look forward to the continued updates on the website. But, but on behalf of the residents, is it possible to have more of an update here at City Council um, for, on a regular basis? I'm not quite sure, Mike, what you would recommend for the frequency of it. But as long as we can have conversation, um, because we do have um, conversations with the residents in that corridor on a regular basis, and it would be nice to give them um, just a, a more personal uh, feedback on that. So I'll, I'll jump in real quick on this, because you know we, um, we agreed as a council last, it was a month ago that we agreed to come back in a month. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't think, with a, with a website that's there, that has updates being regularly applied, and especially if you, know, you Darren, and your staff are, are applying those updates on a regular basis, I would suggest that we point residents in that direction. That's fine, too. Um, sure. Because, you know, and frankly, I know that we record all this, but I, I think the website's probably going to be more effective than them okay. hearing us no talk worries. about it in a lot of ways. What I will say, though, is there, there are some deadlines coming up here, I think, that you have in your mind of times that this is going to be really important. It sounds to me like an update sometime in March could be useful, which is also right around the time that we start talking about budgets. But budget hearings are not happening until April this year, right, Mike? Is that basically it? Yeah. So maybe as we get closer to March, we can see where we sit 
sure. and potentially put something on the agenda for that. Um, I but I would encourage all of us to, to push people to the website that you have set up to be able to see those updates because I think it could yeah, be absolutely. really Absolutely. I think useful. that's a great idea, and I'm happy to, to share that information. But it, I think in to see your progress and to share in that uh, with you as well, I think I agree. March would be a great time. Great. So thank yeah. you. So we'll look at that a little more as we get closer to that time frame. Ms. Wethel. So as a scenario, if I have um, a few days where I have a lot of residents calling me to say, boy, Katie, it's bad again, I can send them real time to that website. How often are you updating that? As far as, for instance, my thought is, if you know the stirring it up is going to happen on Thursday, could we put something that states, this is our plan for the week, uh, we will not be surprised if that stirs up some odor and accelerates it for these days, and our hope is that it will last this long. Yeah, and we can, we can make sure that we're updating that with every, when anytime there's an activity that we take, so like we're taking delivery of these additional things this week, um, that we, um, that we, have the quotes to clean it out and how that kind of changes the, the mm -hmm. milestones to the better. Um, yeah, definitely can add that things. I mean, um, I guess that's the, the one thing I would say. When, we have, when something does happen, when we do something, we can make sure we just add that as a entry in, in there. So we can, we can definitely do that more than we have been. Um, well, and honestly, just for me, so that I can sure. look at it and yeah. say, okay, I might see more calls on these days this week, and I'll be prepared to tell them why that is. Yeah. So, thank okay. you. Yeah, sure. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. This, this may be totally off the wall, but could you float something over the storage tank, like vegetable oil that would inter interrupt the volatilization of, of the odiferous substance? I would have said uh, a triple F foam before it was, we discovered it was awful of PFAS, but because that, that that would be a bad idea. But um, that's something we use in hazardous materials mitigation a lot is um, put some kind of barrier over the liquid that's volatilizing so it can't. I don't know if that's doable or not, but put it in your thought list, and you don't have we to come back and say, that. "Rick, that was dumb." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every op we're every option is worth consideration. Um, We'll have to look and see what might be effective. I mean, like right now, there's probably probably a pretty good snow ice pack. Over yeah, there snow ice pack, and there's still. I mean, I go down there every day. There's still the odors are still there, so I don't know how much that that's mitigating, but it's yeah, it's worth worth considering things like that. Um, with it being gone in about a month, you know, it might not, you know, be worth the expense, but it's definitely worth getting an answer to. Mr. Resnick. Yeah, sure. Thank you for a great update. So in the federal, uh, pardon me, in the February uptick that we're planning, is there flexibility in timing so that we might have some strong westerly winds occurring <laughs> that day? I mean, when we get closer, we'll, we'll know when the contractor, you know, plans to mobilize and, and actually do the work. So it, it might be possible that it's scheduled based on the weather. I mean, that would be helpful if we can't have that flexibility. But and so the, your hydrogen sulfide detector, so that's, uh, I mean, the, the, it kind of like smells the air then, right? Just the amount of hydrogen sulfide is going to tell you the amount of offensive odor. Is that how you work that? And, and, and what are you using to uh, determine that, the level of the hydrogen sulfide? So it's really measuring the hydrogen sulfide in the system or the treatment train, as I'll call it. So we'll measure it, <clears throat> and there are certain parts of the process <clears throat> that be able to emit that more than others. So we try to mitigate it in those facilities. So the less hydrogen sulfide there are in the clarifiers, for example, the less that's going to be emitted. So we reduce the amount of hydrogen sulfide in the clarifiers. So we're not really measuring the hydrogen sulfide in the air, per se. That's something else we can look at down the road as we're assessing, you know, because we can reduce hydrogen sulfide by 50% that's going into the clarifier and 40% here or whatever, but uh, maybe to your point, we're still going to have to reassess, and that's what I was getting at at the last slide is 
or this one of the last slides is reevaluate or continue evaluating how well are we meeting it. Is this does this go far enough? And to that, we might need to do some sort of hydrogen sulfide measurements at certain locations. I think you can do that, measure air quality, um, maybe on Grandview or something like that. That might be something that we do, but we, aren't, we don't currently measure the hydrogen sulfide in the air. Okay, so right now you take, I know you have regular samples that you take, uh, fluid samples. Um, uh, and so that's, that you're gonna be checking those? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Darren, thank you very much for the update. We really appreciate it. And your <laughs> continuing updates on the website. We appreciate all the work you're doing. That, yeah. Well, motion here is by Jones, second by Farber to receive and file and hear this presentation. So, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number three is Dubuque Brewing and Malting Building Update 3000 Jackson. Mr. Mayor. Motion that we receive and file and listen to the presentation. Second by Wethel. Motion by Sprank and a second by Wethel. Um, straight to Alexis, all right. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Alexis Seger, Housing and Community Development Director. I've uh, seen Assistant Director Mike Belmont the last couple of times, so uh, we're gonna switch it up, but he's here in case you have really detailed questions. Um, so for an update since last time, um, we had switched to demolition was the last update that you had received. Um, and since then we have received the information from the contractor that yes, we're applying to get a permit to demo um, 3000 Jackson. 3000 Jackson is actually starts at the archway on Jackson Street and goes towards 30th Street. The remainder of the building would stay. So that is still the plan today. Um, and we have the contractor that's been mobilizing. They also, um, part of that demolition permit is looking for things like asbestos. So the asbestos report was done and sent to the DNR and that was received back. So the 10 day period is now up, meaning they can go and start abating the asbestos in the building. That has to happen before any of the other demolition uh, occurs. Um, today, the owner, Steve Emerson, did let us know that uh, it is too cold for the contractor to mobilize this week, so they plan to start next week on the asbestos abatement side. Um, once the asbestos abatement is done and we get all of the other sign-offs on the permit, meaning uh, Black Hills, Alliant Energy, all the utilities have to sign off that it's safe to bring the building down, things are being capped correctly, um, then we can issue the, the go-ahead for the remainder of the demolition um, once that abatement of the asbestos is completed. So tonight, um, Steve Emerson is here virtually, and um, he is requesting some funding. There were a couple uh, questions that were submitted um, prior to this for um, answers, and we did get a couple of them for City Council. Um, staff time, we looked at the amount of time that staff has put into the closure of the road and um, since we've issued a demolition notice um, and all of the materials, so cement barriers for closing the roads, the fences, the um, having to pay Selco for the emergency barriers and then having to have our own barriers replace those. Um, so we did, we did look at that and staff to date in the last six to 12 months of time, each department had a little different timeline um, of when they had to step in. We've spent $75,000 on that street, street closure so far. Um, that's, that would be Public Works Engineering and Housing's time to close all of those streets. What was not recorded in that $75,000 of time and materials is the time for the police department as they've been having to reroute traffic, deal with truck traffic issues and other, uh, obviously, issues that come with closed streets. Um, and also I know the fire marshal put in some time into making sure that each of the routes was um, specifically uh, still safe for those that are on that street and that time was not included either. So we're around $75,000, but there are some costs that were unable to be um, identified as of tonight. Um, but we can continue to keep track of those as we go forward. Um, so we, uh, uh, that's all of our updates. Steve Emerson does want to, um, speak to where he's at, and I believe he wants to request some funding, so he is here virtually um, to do that if you want to hear from him. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Mr. Emerson, this is Mayor Kavanaugh. You can um, go ahead and unmute and uh, provide us with whatever information you like, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, 
I uh, came to Dubuque about six years ago to do the right thing, and it's been a very costly mistake. I've never meant to put you guys in a bad position with your constitu constituents. Uh, last week, many community members have reached out, called me uh, because they've heard of the demolition plan and they want to try to save in the building. Uh, I don't, I've been looking to try to do that for the last six years. So I would like to proceed with demolition on the south building and then look to uh, secure funding and move forward with redeveloping the north building, the 3040 Jackson building, into um, a redevelopment into housing. I appreciate the council and city staff considering my proposal of uh, participating at the level of 500,000 to my project. I understand the condition of this building has un un understandably led to a negative community reaction that you've had to deal with. I'm working diligently with new partners in the community to finalize a plan that can be executed quickly. Um, I've, I've heard what you said, I've listened, and this plan recycles all the material we can salvages whatever we can and opens the streets to the absolute fastest timeline possible. If for some reason you guys vote against the contribution, I would hope that you consider it again in the near future when the plans and financial information becomes more clear. If you have any questions, I, I can attempt to answer them. This is basically in response to what I've heard from you guys in the past. Okay, thank you, Mr. Emerson. Um, Mike, do you have anything to add or to Alexis's update? Okay. All right. Let's open it up for discussion then. Ms. Wethel. Mr. Emerson, I appreciate you being here with us tonight um, and for being consistent in correspondence of recent. Um, a couple of just very specific um, ways that this has impacted the community. You said negative community reaction, that we are in a bad place with constituents. Um, I think this is a lot more than that for me. Um, this is about public safety. This is about um, people feeling that they can sleep at night in their homes and be safe that a business cannot go under because of the financial constraints the situation has placed upon businesses in the area. And so I will, I will just share that I feel that it's more than that um, for the folks I've spoken to and the folks I represent. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Wethel. Mr. Resnick. Yes, thank you. Mr. Emerson, I, I appreciate uh, the, the maximum acceleration that you are applying now. Uh, I, I, I wish, uh, everybody wishes it could be saved. Uh, we, we don't control that, do we? So sometimes it just can't be. Uh, and um, it's a tough time of year to do things, but I, I, I appreciate that you are moving uh, with all due haste to get this done. And uh, I, I'm with you there. Please do everything you can uh, to continue along that path. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Ms. Roussel, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting tonight um, when um, Alexis kind of brought to our attention the dollars that we're already spending um, to support the important the public safety um, nature of this issue. Um, so the city is already investing many dollars in this project. Um, I'm not sure that investing more city dollars um, is the correct way to go. Um, we, we're already burdening, burdening our citizens, especially in that area, and using additional city dollars adds additional burden to our citizens. Um, I was glad to hear that we're going to be recycling as much as possible. I think that's really important. I'm glad that there's a focus on opening the street as soon as possible, um, especially for the, the businesses and citizens in that area. So those are just a few comments I had. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Sell. Well, I'll try and, try and cover a little bit here. Um, 
So there, there, there are a few things. I mean, first of all, I, I think we're all clear on the frustration level. I think we're all clear on um, what this impact really has been. Ms. Wethel, I think you pointed out some really important pieces of that there. Um, you know, historically going back, you know, the city did enter into a development agreement um, on this particular property. We um, have worked um, with you, Mr. Emerson, to, to try and um, find a path forward. It looks like going back about, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say about seven years or so at this point. Um, I, I guess I struggle at this point with the idea that the, we're, the city is going to jump in and add, um, I mean, the request that you made via email was $500,000, and, and the, the idea that the city jumps in to provide that funding uh, to move forward, while I understand that would be helpful and that could speed the timeline up, it just doesn't seem like the proper use of public funds at this time, to me at least. I, I think that's just my personal opinion. Now, I want to be really clear on something because um, we don't have this on the agenda right now to vote on as a as an official proposal, so we need to be cognizant of that as a council as we have this discussion. Um, that's not to say, Mr. Emerson, that we, we couldn't have an official proposal that would be more clear, that would, would be something we could look at um, down the line here. But I, what I would hope that we could figure out is how you can work with, um, you know, you, you've already mentioned some other private entities that you're working with to be able to get this done. Um, I, uh, I just, I, I'm, I'm reticent to, to jump in with, uh, with a vote for moving forward with the city backing um, that level of financing to be able to, to help with this project at this at this point. I mean, we've had this on every single city council agenda for the last, I think, what, two to three months at this point to try to move this forward. I think now we just, we need to go and, and get this done. So um, I guess that's all I have for right now. Uh, I don't think I have any specific questions. Um, Mr. Emerson, I did, you know, you, you had the opportunity to be here tonight. We really appreciate you coming to, to discuss this with us. Um, I do want to throw it back to you uh, for any further comments because I'm, I'm definitely not insinuating that this is the end of any conversation. I just want to, um, you know, stress where my thoughts are right now personally. But I'll give it back to you for a few minutes here to, to share anything else you'd like to share before we move on to the next agenda item. No, and I respect that it's not on the agenda and perhaps uh, having a couple more weeks to uh, put together a more clear plan and um, be more clear with you on, on what the need is and what it will do for you uh, will be helpful. So I'll circle back with the, the people I'm working with in Dubuque and try getting you some a little bit more concise information. Okay, appreciate that, Mr. Emerson. And I do encourage you to continue to work, um, you know, as closely as possible with our Housing and Community Development Department and any other departments that we need to to move forward here. Um, as I'm sure you're clear on, our priority here is the safety of the residents that are in that neighborhood, first and foremost. Um, safety of anybody who would be driving by, which means we need the road open as soon as possible. So whatever expediency you can move with, we, we certainly appreciate. But thank you once again for being here. Thank you. Okay, motion here is to receive and file here that presentation. Thank you very much, Alexis and Mike, for, for being here as well. Um, motion by Sprank and a second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number four is Schmidt Island Management Agreement between the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and the Schmidt Island Development Corporation approval. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Jones? I move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Leisure Services Manager Marie Ware is recommending City Council approval of the Schmidt Island Management Agreement between the City of Dubuque and the Schmidt Island Development Corporation. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. All right. Thank you, Mike. Discussion. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. It wasn't very long ago when the... Um, Dubuque Ice Organization kind of crumbled and fell under its own weight that we were fearing that we're getting this thing handed back to us and be stuck with it. And how do we how do we extricate ourselves from that or find a path forward? Because we want ice. We want to be, be able to, to skate. We want to hockey in Dubuque. That's That's been a big deal to a lot of people. And we, uh, we asked the Dubuque Racing Association if they were interested in it. And to our surprise, frankly, they said, yeah. And they've really nailed it. They've, uh, they've got more life and activity down there than, than we ever, I think, could have imagined. And the, uh, 
the Schmidt Island Development Corporation is a subset of the DRA and, and is uh, doing some great work and now he has some funding to do some great work. This this is just a great uh, agreement. This gets us everything that we want as a city out of that facility. It takes a lot of pressure off of our park and our leisure services department, which is uh, overloaded and understaffed uh, kind of chronically. And I'm, I'm pretty tickled to vote for this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. And just to echo what Mr. Jones had said, it's also, uh, there's an opportunity here with the addition of the hockey teams from the University of Dubuque and the attraction of students and their families that hopefully at some point there might be some self-sustaining operations uh, from that part of the operation there for the ice arena. So I think this is a great step forward and, and look forward to um, working with them and hopefully uh, their fees will um, be lower over time. Thank you. Any others? Well, I'm really happy about this. Uh, you know, Marie, thanks for, for being here and for working on this and, um, you know, setting this up as a way that uh, is very similar to some of the other arrangements that we have. Uh, this has been, it's been a great addition. I, I think having the DRA manage this has been a great addition for this. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I, I don't want to, I want to make sure I give credit to the people that have, that have held this this facility up for so many years too. Uh, there were some real challenges when some major work was needed. And um, you know, we worked our way through it, we got it done. The, the work is done now engineering wise, but we sometimes we need to go to the next level. And I really think that um, from a level of service standpoint, this really does it. It's been, I've heard nothing but good things about how things are going at the ice arena. Um, the I'm on arena, uh, as I'm on ice arena now that we are, are here in, in Dubuque. So I think it's, uh, it's really good. And I'm, I'm excited to, to see this moving forward and glad that we've got such a great partner down on Schmidt Island to get this stuff done. All right, so we have a motion by Jones, second by Wethel, to receive and file and adopt this resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number five is creating an equitable community of choice handout update. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? <laughs> I move to receive and file and approve. Second by Wethel? A motion by Roussel and a second by Wethel. Mike, please. Thank you, City Manager Mike Van Milligan. So this has been a long-standing document uh, for our organization and our community. And uh, recently, one of the council members was talking to me about issues in general and said, well, local government's all about equity and transparency. And it made me reflect on the idea that we used to have four pillars in this sheet resiliency, sustainability, equity, and compassion, but we didn't have a pillar for transparency. And I, it was, uh, I think those remarks were right on target is that local government's all about equity and transparency. And so that's why I've added that fifth uh, pillar to this of transparency and then asking the mayor and council to approve this uh, as I use it and other people use it within our organization and outside our organization. Yeah, well, thank you, Mike. I, I think this is a great idea. You know, we had this earlier discussion here with uh, with Troy Patzner, our, our assessor, and talked a little bit about some of the um, the new the new law that is uh, has to do with property taxes. One of the pieces of that is actually a transparency piece, where people are going to be getting something in the mail that would be uh, a little more clear for them about what their property taxes are really going to look like. I actually really like that idea. I support it. There's a cost that goes along with it, but I like the idea of being more transparent. And basically, when this law was going through the legislature last year, I had multiple conversations with legislators where I would say, I think it's a great idea. Dubuque does that. Dubuque is totally transparent in how we, we present our budgetary information. We weren't mailing it out in the way the legislature is now telling us to do, but we do have hours and hours and hours of budget hearings in ways that other cities don't. And we do that for the purpose of not only making the best decision we can with the most information possible, but being open and transparent about that process, making sure that everybody can see it. It is a pillar we're already standing on, and to be able to state it on a, on a document that we share widely, I think is a, a really good addition. So thank you very much for doing it. I'm definitely going to approve of this. Any other comments or questions for that matter? Okay. Well, thanks for your work on this, Mike, and for everybody. 
Motion here is by Roussel, second by Wethel, to receive and file and approve. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number six is static display of engine 505 and medic 554. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file. Second, second. by Farber. Motion by Jones, second by Farber. Mike, coming to you. Well, I actually don't have anything. It's sure. Just a just a note. Then I can just say it from here. It looks like we're going to have um, the the new engine five hundred five and medic five 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 four being on display here at the federal building uh, right before the city council meeting and work session on February fifth. So from five thirty to six p.m. on February fifth, it will be here for us to see, and then for anybody else who would like to come and see. To, See what uh, some of the new great additions to the fire department. So, okay, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Jones. And let me just say that uh, the new fire engine will sound like a fire engine. We've uh, <laughs> we've moved away from uh, the old uh, coaster sirens. Um, their their technology is upgraded. They're better in every way. Every city will tell you that uses them. So this truck's going to sound like a fire engine going down the street instead of uh, instead of a more modern. Vehicle. I think that's kind of neat and way more effective and safer. Yeah, it's great. Another example of a very good investment in public safety. All right. Motion here is to receive and file by Jones, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number seven is request for work session, secondary responder initiative. Mr. Mr. Mayor. So, I move to receive a file and discuss uh, with council. Okay. Second by Sprank. Uh, motion by Russell, second by Sprank. So the work session is being asked to be scheduled March 18th at 5.45 p.m. Does that work with everybody? It appears to. Excellent. Okay. It will be scheduled at that time. So, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number eight is public works response to snow event videos. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. I move that we receive and file and view the videos. Second by Wethel. Motion by Farber, second by Wethel. Well, Eric has already informed me there are two videos, oh. so I will stay silent in between them. <laughs> <laughs> we can roll those videos, Eric. So one of the main ways the community can help us when we're plowing is actually not having cars on the street. So if possible, and it's not possible in a lot of places, but if it is possible, having your car in your driveway or off the street anywhere, they can park in the ramps for free, helps us speed-wise, it's a lot faster for us, and helps us get the road cleaner. Again, getting the vehicles off the streets is, is just a tremendous help to us. Getting the streets clear is, is the main priority right now. The way we prioritize it, we actually have primaries, secondaries, and residentials. Most snowstorms, we classify primaries and secondaries together. We look at traffic counts, the speed, and also the elevation of the topography of um, the area. So we just definitely want to make sure we, we touch the most dangerous routes that people will be driving before we get into residential. So that's where you get your primaries, then your secondaries, and your residential areas. The number one complaint is, is people don't want the snow in front of their driveway once they've shoveled their driveway. Windrows are any material that's pushed to the side. Anytime we're plowing the street, unfortunately you're going to get a windrow to one side of the truck or the other. We try to be fair. Half of the street goes to one side and half of the street goes to the other side, so one person doesn't have more than the other. It's a necessary thing to get the snow off the road and I would uh, tell people that the windrow in my driveway at home right now is just as bad as anybody else's in town. So that's how they accumulate and with this storm being 
11.5 to 12 inches. They're huge, that's what they are, and so you're gonna see some in your driveways, And but to plow the snow, they're just created. You're standing in the street, facing your driveway. If you shovel the snow from your approach to the left, when the plow comes, they'll push it past your driveway, not back into your driveway. So the less snow you have on the right-hand side of your driveway, the less will get plowed into your driveway. The challenging part is being out in a snowstorm and, and doing the plowing. I mean, it's, it's slippery and hard to get around, just like for everybody else it is for us too. I'd like to let the community know that we are trying our best. We're always out there trying our best, trying to get it done as fast as possible with as little impact to the community as possible. So I have to say, I was not surprised to learn after the shoveling that I was able and um, had the opportunity to do this past week. I was not surprised to learn at all that it was the most snow we've ever received in a week's time. That's, that's accurate, right? That's what that, the, I think that's what uh, Randy Gale was telling us. The most snow we've ever received in Dubuque in a week's time. I mean, that, it was intense. And I have to tell you, I've lived in a few places where they don't do the greatest job at getting the snow off the streets. We have a, such an incredible team in Public Works to be able to get this job done. And just, I mean, absolutely deserve a hand for that. Work. I was, I, I mean, and, and I know, you know, there's still some snow on the streets in some places, some of the, the more secondary and, you know, the, the roads that aren't the main roads, but that's because of the weather. It's the way that it is. Um, you know, we could dump their entire pile of salt out there on some of this stuff and it'd still be there. Um, and as it gets warmer, we're going to start to see those streets come get cleared off again because they're going to be out there again doing it. Um, all the folks that work for Public Works are going to be out there doing it. And I just, I thank them so much for this work. It, it keeps the roads safer. It helps everybody else as we get around. It helps the fire department get to where they need to get um, to make sure that they're able to respond to emergencies. Police department get where they need to get. Obviously, garbage trucks be able to go where they need to go. So um, really, really appreciate that. And I've, I was also, you know, watching these videos on social media, always happy to see the appreciation from residents on social media too. Social media can be a dark place at times. And in moments like this, it's really nice to see people complimenting each other. So I really appreciate that. And those are great videos too. So thanks to our public information office once again. All right, motion there by Farber, second by Wethel. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, I just want to add one comment. Um, these are big, dangerous machines. And I, I ran across this in social media. It was written by a, by a plow operator in a rural setting where they're operating a little quicker. But it's not uncommon that uh, you don't just get a windrow that things are, objects are thrown a bit of a ways from the blade. So if your kids are out playing in the front yard and they hear a snow plow coming, they should come up at least on the porch. Um, there's some danger getting hit by a rock or a chunk of ice or getting covered up with snow that uh, is very real. And uh, that, that wasn't part of this message, but uh, but it should be part of everybody's thinking all the time. These are big, dangerous machines, and they're out there under pretty terrible conditions, sometimes with, with impaired visibility. So give them some room as much as you possibly can. Thanks, Randy. And then Thanks. second, that other thing, man, I, I was driving around a little bit Saturday, and I couldn't believe how easy it was to get around Dubuque with uh, the most snowfall we'd ever had in, in a mm -hmm. short period of time. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry, I started to speed past things. I didn't even open for comments. Go ahead, Mr. Red. Well, I just wanted to shout out to our city employee, Ariel Swift, who uh, baptized by snowstorm uh, for this. <laughs> and uh, she proved uh, once again that John Klosterman was right to recommend her and, and uh, Mike Van Milligan to hire her as, uh, and, as leading that uh, position. So it was great. Um, and of course, uh, in my house, it's like my wife never wants me to go anywhere if there's any snow on the ground. I said, you know, we got to do this. And, and like Mr. Jones, it was really, they did a great job in so many areas. So I just wanted to pass on those comments, especially for Ariel, Ariel Swift and her department. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. All right. Well, motion by Farber, second by Wethel. Adrian, could you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Wethel? Kavanaugh? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number nine is 2023 City of Dubuque year end video. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick? I move to receive and file and view the video. Second okay. by. 
Motion by Resnick, a second by Wethel. We can roll the video, please, Eric. in a great city, don't we? I love, I just love this place. It's great. And those, these videos are, they're just, they're such a great way of telling the story of what Dubuque really is. So thank you so much for producing those. All right. Motion by Resnick, second by Wealthel to watch that. Adrian, call the roll, please. Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Next are council member reports. All right, reports this evening. Ms. Roussel. Thanks. I'd just like to say thanks to the students at the uh, Alta Vista campus for inviting me and several of us to come and speak to their class. It was really a great opportunity, not only to share our message, but to encourage those uh, young people to get involved in our community. There are so many ways that uh, people can get involved, and it's important for them to know that their young voices are so important. So I appreciate the invitation, and um, it was a great time. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I, I also spent a fabulous hour at the Alternative Learning Center in Alta Vista, and, and everything Laura said was absolutely true. Um, spent a, a great evening last Monday night at uh, the Grand River Center with, with Special Olympics, where we welcomed several hundred athletes and coaches and friends to Dubuque uh, to ski and skate. Um, and they got a little more skating out of the deal than, than was planned because it got so cold Tuesday and windy that uh, chairlifts were not running at sundown and, and transportation to Albrecht Acres where the snowshoeing occurred was was not safe and, and feasible. But transportation to Dubuque, I, I'm sorry, to the Imon Ice Center was, was relatively easy. So we had some skiers skating and some snowshoers skating. And David volunteered again to help me provide some music for him for a dance. And it's it's the one night of the year where our little band is the is the Beatles at Shea Stadium. The exception being that the Beatles were hardly ever asked to play the chicken dance at the Hokey Pokey. <laughs> but it was a great evening for everybody. We we're glad to be a part of it. And uh, and it's it's so good from from our perspective as as a band that uh, two folks, Dan Norman and Rebecca, what's Rebecca's last name? Lansing. Lansing. Rebecca Lansing volunteered to fill in for a couple of our missing members. You know, they don't play with us regularly. They don't earn money from us from because we do this one pro bono. But oh, special, yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> and they nailed it. It was good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Mr. Resnick, go well, for it. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was going to say this second, but I but sister uh, since Mr. Jones brought it up first, I'm going to say it first. And uh, you mentioned that getting involved was so important. And I remember. Um, I want to talk about Dubuque and their outstanding volunteers. Um, we saw the article about how Dubuqueers give so much money to charities, which is fantastic. But we also have uh, volunteers, many of them who are sitting up here right now. But I just want to uh, point out that uh, Rick Jones has volunteered at this event for more than 30 years. And this is not just showing up and saying hi to people, right? So he's there all day setting up a band. Then he performs all night. And then he needs to break everything down. And so by the time it's 10 o'clock, he might be home. 
and then spends the next day in bed with some aspirin. You know, I, I mean, there's, he really does a ton of work and he's done it for so long. And that's what I first started to talk to him about different things when I was part of this. And I saw and looked at the list of the things that he's done, been on the different boards and all these volunteering things that he's done. It's like, well, maybe I should be able, I should do something here besides, you know, feed my family. Uh, um, so he inspired me to do things like run for city council and do other charitable events. Fantastic uh, example of, of what a Dubuque citizen can be doing. And uh, so I think that uh, Rick Jones, after 30 plus years, uh, uh, he deserves an applause from the city council. And second, all right, so second, I, I do want to say I went to, uh, I got a tour of Dubuque Stamp and Manufacturing uh, downtown on Central Avenue, and I was just shocked at how big that place is, because I, I always, my wife and I always go by on our bikes down by the bike trail, and it's like always noisy, and things are, you know, the sound of uh, sound of money being made is always kind of fun to hear. And so, but uh, the person who owns it uh, and the person who ru uh, runs it, uh, those two people gave me a tour. And I just was very impressed with the millions of dollars invested in that facility, how it's been, uh, you know, there's been a manufacturing facility at that location since 1947. And it was shoe leather first and, you know, shoes. And then uh, it was taken uh, over uh, and gradually and then became Dubuque Stamp and Manufacturing. And so we have these local employees and they're all, and the, from what they were saying, they perform at a very high level. They appreciate the citizens of Dubuque who work there. And uh, their top customers are John Deere and Caterpillar. And uh, so they get, get along with uh, both of those. And so an international, they deliver internationally. And they're right here uh, on uh, Central Avenue in Dubuque. It's, it, was a, it was a great uh, tour, and I appreciate that very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ms. Wethel. It has been 13 days since we heard of the devastating incidents in Perry, Iowa. On Sunday, Principal Dan Marburger succumbed to his injuries suffered from his close range gunshot wounds that he endured as he tried to de-escalate an act of violence. He very bravely and selflessly gave his own life so that his staff and students could escape to safety. His loss for his family and his community is devastating. To know Coach Marburger was to know a man of love of the field of education and the children he served. As my high school teacher and basketball coach, I will be grateful for his presence in my life. Last week, I wrote him a letter to thank him for his powerful influence in my life and his heroic act of love. I sent it on Thursday. He died Sunday morning after battling his injuries for 10 days. I know that he never read my letter, but I wanted to share part of it tonight with you so that the world could know that Dan Marburger was a hero way before January 4th. Dear Coach, all of us who are lucky to have called you coach have been thinking of you. I have sent prayers, positive thoughts to you and your family on your healing journey. You've made an impact on so many children in your career, but I wanted to share with you that I don't think that I would be the woman I am today without your mentorship. You taught me the life skill of what it means to be part of a team it didn't matter if I had the athletic skills to be a starter, but more importantly, I was there to practice, contribute to positive energy, and do my part with whatever skills I possessed. You helped me to realize and be seen and helped me realize my own power and strength. The summer before my junior year, we went to the Makokata basketball camp as a team. It is as crisp a memory for me as any. At the end of the week, I was awarded the camp's hustle award. I have joked over the years that's not an award normally given to the most athletic kid in the camp. 
The first practice of the season, you called me out to the team, and you said, Katie Dickinson, this summer you earned the Camps Hustle Award. That means something to me. We all need to hustle like Katie. I think from that time forward, I've labeled myself as someone who could hustle. I was willing to work hard, read more, stay late, and give more. It was as if that was a self-fulfilling prophecy for me. That one moment of acknowledgement is a pivotal moment. I was more than a so-so high school basketball player. I was a hustler. I went on to share with Coach Marburger that I have done what I have done in my life to prove him right. And at the end of my letter, I made a promise to him that I will continue to hustle and I will continue to do the hard work. It is not acceptable to make lists of those things that we cannot change as we look for answers to the violence of what happened in Perry, Iowa. I have been told a city government cannot change state and federal gun safety legislation. I have been told that we have no say in the allocation and distribution of state funding for those that desperately need brain health care. I do not want to hear what we cannot change. I want our city to lead. I want to have a formal conversation with experts in their specialties right here in Dubuque to ask the question, what more can be done? Suggested evidence-based research and even the United States Secret Service National Threat Assessment documents recommendations that include actions to be taken to prevent this violence. Examples include teaching students and adults, not just educators, but parents and grandparents, to watch for and report specific warning signs of violence. Develop and publicize around the clock anonymous tip lines for the reporting behavior to our local authorities. When behavior is identified, have clear processes to conduct behavior threat assessments. Bringing stakeholders together of school leadership that educate all of the children of the city of Dubuque. Poli police, specifically our school resource officers. Those who specialize in psychiatry and psychology in our city. Our institutions of higher learning, especially those who are training our future educators to learn evidence-based strategies to reach hearts and minds of children. Then we need to listen so that we can make sure that our residents know what services are available to them. We can work together, keeping safe spaces for all those we serve. I ask tonight that we all hustle. I want Coach Marburger's sacrifice to be more than a headline. more than thoughts and prayers and memories. I want his example to remind us all of who we are and the strength that we possess. Tonight, I ask my council colleagues and our city staff to consider how we can come together to have a more formal conversation about what is possible when we believe in one another and prevent this heartbreak from happening again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bethel. Well, we have a closed session, so I'll entertain a motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move that the City Council go into closed session in accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa to discuss purchase or sale of real estate. Um, I'd, would you like to add, uh, there's another piece to add to that on the agenda. It's confidential records. And confidential records. Thank right, you. Thank you. Second. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. For the record, the attorney the City Council will consult with on the matters to be discussed in closed session is Senior Counsel Barry Lindahl. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Farber. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We are in closed session.